welcome to Best Way to Divorce live stream. And I've got Jenny Rock back with me because there's more I wanted to ask her. Jenny is specialized not just as a, a, co a coach, a parenting coach, but particularly she has a lot of experience where there's a great deal of conflict. And so we're gonna be centering on some of that today. So welcome back, Jenny. And just to start with, for those who haven't met you yet, can you remind everyone uh, what your title is, the area that you really specialise in? Because you're not just a, a regular coach, are you? No, sure. Um, thank you for having me. And uh, my name is Jenny Rock, and I am a co-parenting conflict resolution expert. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> but it's accurate and and to begin yeah. with I wanted if you don't mind me getting a little bit personal uh, I know you had a particularly traumatic experience yourself as a as a co-parent and and it, it is quite extreme but there will still be elements of this that unfortunately a lot of people will recognize but I wondered yeah. if you could just briefly describe the situation you were in and how that how that felt and what it really was like. So talking about it from the inside and how it affected mm. your decision making and your thinking. Yeah, I think there were there were I could choose a number of examples, but uh, one of the examples would be that because we owned the home joint the home jointly, he had left but he still was legally allowed access to the home. So I went off to work my son at nursery, picked him up from nursery, came home, and I would always feel sick with fear because I didn't know if he would be stood there in the waiting in the lounge waiting for us to walk in the door or not. And just that thought, just the thought that he might be there, absolutely terrified me because I normally knew that if he was there, he'd probably be drinking or doing something else that was not particularly appropriate and I was going to get grief um, in an understating kind of way um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah it was the sheer fear of of not knowing what I was going to walk into so and sometimes there'd be nobody there yeah, I think a lot of people will be very um, shocked and, and sadly this is something I've come across quite often where you said, as you said, until you get divorced and everything sorted on the financial side and, and agreeing on who's going to have the property and all of that, which can with a difficult person, particularly if they have a narcissistic element to their character, take years for some people. Um, but you don't have, you know, you don't even have the power to have your own safe space and it can be very difficult. You can't just, you know, technically you're not supposed to change the locks and all of those things. So it's very, very tricky. Um, can you give some idea of how you were able to deal with that? Because I mean, obviously the best thing is you just take your children and go somewhere else where they can't come in. But how do you do that? And it's so disruptive financially and also for the children. Absolutely. And I didn't really want to move my child from his home. It's the only home he'd ever known. Um, and I mean, for me, the sheer terror of going to sleep, not knowing if he was going to come back in the night or anything like that. Um, and because I had been so manipulated, because I was completely kind of sucked into this very narcissistic world that I couldn't escape from, I didn't think I had any choices. I really didn't. I spoke to the solicitor and he said, well, he legally he owns part of the property, half of the property, so he can let himself in and out whenever he likes. And for years, it wasn't just weeks, it was years, I would kind of go to sleep with one eye open because I was so terrified that I was going to be one of the next statistics that you see in the newspaper mm -hmm. of, you know, ex-girlfriend, mur ex-wife murdered in her bed, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, I lived with that terror for absolute years until I think it's about four years it took to get from separation to divorce and until that time because I've been told and I'm a very law-abiding citizen and I do what I'm told it's right for the law um, I did what I was told to do and I didn't change the locks and health-wise 
it was a disaster. And, and it's interesting because the, the le- I often say to people, I'm not a lawyer, so I can say things that the lawyers are just not allowed <laughs> to say. Uh, and unfortunately, if you do absolutely stick to the rules, it's it, it, the rules are designed for people behaving reasonably. And there's yeah. a real issue there and a safety issue as well, and definitely around the psychology and, and the trauma. What would you do without this being any official advice to anybody who's <laughs> listening? Uh-huh. But what would you have done differently with what you know now? Um, I would have left. I would have left. Um, And (laughs) I want to say never to be found again. (laughs) But that would obviously be the wrong advice to tell anybody. But I would have walked away. Um, I didn't have the strength at that time to go against the manipulation that I was facing. And when you've been subjected to that kind of abuse for years and years and years, you you have your brain defaults to the safest option and the safest option is what you know, is what you know which is an unsafe situation so that's safer than actually walking away and risking the consequences of walking away which have been drummed into you over years if you leave i will find you i will kill you you know you you believe it you honestly believe it and you are so trapped in this world and you're trying to do everything right to escape and and it feels like there is no escape because even if you get legally divorced legally divorced that doesn't mean suddenly you can say oh you can't stay in the house anymore because that's a separate process that's the financial side isn't it and I think that's often Absolutely. very shocking to people um with the what's really interesting about what you just said is that you know, when it's in an extreme situation like that there is certainly part of you that just wants to leave disappear but the trouble is you've got a child and their father or mother because obviously this does work both ways Absolutely. um as, as you know in, in the work that you do so you've you've got a responsibility there to the child's other parent however toxic they may be and sometimes they are also toxic to the child so that's one whole can of worms but sometimes there it is possible to manage that co-parenting relationship even though you might be physically emotionally unsafe with that person it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case for the child and denying them that other parent and that's a really difficult situation to be in it is it is and and um when we separated my ex went completely off the rails um he actually turned yellow from uh, from drinking too much and his liver was failing and uh, the doctor was saying if you don't stop drinking you're gonna have a fit and if you have a fit you're gonna die the 80 percent chance you'll die um but he had a new girlfriend and the new girlfriend was was much much younger. I was replaced with a much much younger model, you know, slim and beautiful and and a been else. there. But she was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she was actually a, a nice person, and she absolutely adored our son. And what I did was I actually had a conversation with her, and she she said to me, "No matter what, if if he needs to be removed from his dad's um, sort of uh, area." I will bring him back to you. I will bring him back to you. And that gave me some reassurance that I had somebody on the inside that would actually look out for Joe. I didn't care what she thought about me. I didn't care whether she liked me, hated me, whatever. All I was concerned about was, is my child safe? And I had to let go because she she was the one that he'd had the affair with. I had to let go of the anger and the bitterness Mm. towards her because I needed her on my side. Yeah. I needed her on, on my son's side to to bring him back if dad spiraled out of control. So I had that reassurance and I would say to, to anybody in that situation, ego has to go out the window, you know? Yeah. Ego doesn't matter. The only thing that matters in that moment is, is the child safe? Jenny, I have to say, I mean, Matt, all you do credit to you um it is such a massive thing that you did there and and so right um i didn't have anything like as traumatic a situation but i one of my you know favorite memories is with my 
kid's dad got uh, married to a lovely young lady who was actually just lovely and she allowed me to feel that they were much safer and he could spend they could spend more time with their dad because she was there to make sure everything was okay mm. and and people used to say also oh, they even lived in the same street for a while and people thought told me they thought it was a bit weird and I'm like no it's great <laughs> it works really well because your peace of mind as a mother you know, it is about putting your children or child child first and yeah. take your ego stick it in a cupboard you don't need it it's not it's not serving you however then we have to come to the boundary side of things. So I yes. wanted to talk a little bit about, so with your when ch- a child or children grow up and they've got parents who are in this kind of um, toxic setup, mm-hmm. ideally they, they separate, get divorced, but that co-parenting relationship to some extent is going to be there. So how does that, in your experience, how can that affect the children? So you, you're, you're trying to work it out uh, for yourself as a parent, but it's going to impact the children whatever you Absolutely. do this in some way. Absolutely. And and to be honest, nobody teaches you how to do this because you go into marriage thinking that's it forever, you know? You don't think you're going to be getting divorced 15 years later, 20 years later, and then trying to do everything by yourself. Um, so you're completely unprepared for having to deal with the emotional um, impact of divorce on your child. And that can range. When you've got a child with a toxic co-parenting situation, they can regress, they can start bedwetting, they can start self-harming, they can start uh, basically doing things like alcohol, drugs, anorexia, bulimia, any way to feel in control of their life because their life is spinning out of control because their parents are just saying all sorts of things to them and they don't know what's true and what's not and what happens is that actually skews their brain and it's training them that when they have a relationship this is what it ends up like so they repeat that behavior that they see with their parents because they think that that's the right way to behave Mm -hmm. because that's what they've been trained to do by their parents because children learn by seeing and doing You know, they see what we do and they mimic it. That's how they learn. So in terms of, of, you know, the child's mental health specifically, um, suicide, drug abuse, um, you get uh, substance abuse, you get um, skiving off school, you get um, basically walking out on life. In, In my situation, my son, I thought was coping okay. And he was basically, you know, sort of bouncing between the two houses. And um, we were managing to keep it civil, mainly because I would just give in because that was the easiest, safest option. So he would bounce between the two houses quite happily or so I thought. But then at 14, he completely had a nervous breakdown. Um, He was in bed for four months with migraine. I mean, it was horrendous. And I could, I didn't know why at the time and it was only after we started connecting all the dots that and and he started to communicate again with me because for months even years all I would get would be a thumbs up or a thumbs down and I would take his plate of food to him and leave it and then come back later and remove it and just make sure that he was hydrated fed clean where I could do something about it but one an awful lot I could do um and it was it was when he started talking to me that he started to explain that when I'm there, I have to be somebody different. And I don't like that person that I have to be because I have to be that person to fit in. And that's not me. And I can't cope with that. And I can't live like that. I don't want to live like that. And he doesn't remember much about what happened. He can't tell you specific incidents that he witnessed apart from one and the one thing that he remembers is him sat on the sofa he and I remember it very clearly he was sat on the sofa we'd walked in dad was stood there giving me the glare of death you know drunk whatever some went on the sofa put the tv on for him I was talking to my ex in the kitchen trying to get him away from my son and there's me thinking he's occupied with the TV and all he can hear and this is what he told me was mummy and daddy arguing and screaming and 
what had happened was uh, my ex had actually pinned me up against the wall by the throat and was telling me that I was going to die. And I said, I'm done. If you're going to do it, just do it. I'm sick of the threat of you going to kill me. If you're going to do it, please just do it now. I'm absolutely done. It was kind of like a, a switch went off in my head at that point. And that was when the boundaries really started to, to kick in a little bit for me. Um, and then when, when our son got sick, dad would keep coming around and he would just walk in and go straight up to our son's bedroom. And um, he came downstairs one day and said, uh, you make him see me or I'll make you suffer. And threatened me that he was going to put me up against the wall again and, you know, by the throat and all these other threats. And um, he was looming over me and he'd looked right and left to see if anybody was what was around and um, basically threatened me and that was the moment when I said you are no longer welcome in my home my home is my safe space because by that time it was mine not his not ours mm. it was mine and that was the the moment when I kind of drew the line and really started enforcing boundaries but our son doesn't remember any of that um, he doesn't remember you know he he remembers little things like you know dad was always saying bad things about you and always saying bad things about my partner and you know there was everything in the world was my fault and we'd, we'd laugh about it it was like war in Sudan yeah that's my fault famine in Ethiopia yeah I caused that too um, <laughs> and even now it'd be war in Ukraine that's my fault I obviously told Putin to do that but we um, can laugh but, about it but it does I can laugh about it now children I laugh about it now but the harm it does to the children is massive I had to deal with a suicide attempt, and that was horrific, absolutely horrific. And I wish there had been somebody that I could have spoken to that could have helped me at that time, and I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know how to find somebody. Obviously, Google didn't really tell me a lot because I didn't know mm -hmm. what to put in. Um, and uh, the, the devastation that you can face. Children are so bombarded right now with life on social media, this, that and the other, everything having to be perfect. And then you throw into the mix, oh, mum and dad have split up and they're an absolute nightmare in terms of communication, agreeing on anything, um, coming to terms with not being together anymore, mixed messages, just the whole kit and caboodle. The child has no idea where they stand and children need stability and boundaries. That's and that's be, and that's before you add in the, the 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 violence and the threats and the abusive element. Absolutely, that's what they need in a normal life, mm. you know. Let alone when you kind of you know increase the tension and the aggression and the the violence and you know the awful atmosphere times ten, you know. So we have to take more responsibility for the children's the children's impact, the impact on the children because they didn't ask for this. They didn't choose for the parents to get divorced. They didn't want their parents to get divorced in quite often a lot of cases, because again, it's safe. They know what to expect, you know? What they know is better than the unknown of, of God knows what could happen if they, you know, if they leave. But it's really important that we focus on the kids because they need us so badly. They really do, even if it's just to talk to, to explain, to for somebody to hear how they're feeling, to hear how they're confused, to help them decode and understand what, what it all means. And they can't access that unless we help them. So And then watching you know, and then watching their parents who are not able to manage either of them this situation. And you said something uh, interesting there that, that you the house was already yours. So even though legally there were some boundaries in place because of the nature of the relationship. You weren't able, it, it took a, a, an extreme ex situation for you to even put those boundaries in place, even though legally you already had them. And can you talk a little bit about that kind of gap between, I mean, it's bad enough, as you said, when you, when you know, they can just walk in and out because you haven't sorted that bit yet. But once you have, why is it that 
people stay in this situation because I think people who've never been there don't understand that and they, they might be listening to this and going well, why didn't you just call the police and can you just talk a little bit about um, how you found the courage and what kind of support there was for you yeah I think um, I found the courage because I had to um, I was kind of backed into a corner and you your your brain is not there to make you happy your brain is there to keep you alive and if your brain thinks that keeping you alive means keeping you in a, a very unstable situation um, where you don't know what's going to happen next, but at least you know where the aggression is coming from. At least you know how to sort of talk to somebody when they are coming in and being aggressive to you and how to kind of minimize the damage because that's safer than the consequences of leaving because the consequences of leaving when you have a toxic co-parenting situation the threats of taking the child away, I'm going to report you to social services, you're a bad mother, you're an unfit mother, I'm going to take everything away from you, you're going to have nothing, um, you try and keep me from my son and I'll kill you. Fear is the biggest, biggest thing. And it's not the fear of the police or anything like that, it's the fear of what happens when they go. When the police walk away, You've still got to put up with them. You've still got to cope with them. You still have to hand over your child. You know, when you're doing co-parenting, you have no escape. Therefore, if you call the police, what's going to happen is it's going to make it worse. And that's, that's the mindset that you're in. Because it's safer to not call the police because you know what you're dealing with. Whereas if you call the police, it's almost like you're poking the bear to provoke an even more escalated response. So you kind of go for the lesser of two evils, which I, you know, I have people even now that say to me, why did you stay so long? It's like, I didn't have a choice. If I left, I would be dead. And I know that because I know, you know, I know what that person is like. So. I, I made the choice that I had to make for my safety and for the safety of my child. Because if I tried to leave, and then he then took the child and disappeared abroad with them, how would I find them? You know, if I left and took the child, he would hunt us down. He would kill me, take the child. Or he would take the child, leave me in a you know pretty sorry state, and disappear. And then I lose my child. So... It was kind of the lesser of two evils because these people will, th will threaten anything to get you to behave. And they want you to behave according to their rules and their prescription, their, their guidelines. And you don't really get an awful lot of choice. It, and did you um, get to a point though, you said you finally, you were like, I've, I've had it. I'm this. done, yeah. What, yeah. what were you able to do then? Did you involve the police? What happened? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, I had, he came around uh, drunk again and he was uh, knocking on the door and I refused to answer the door because I had no interest in talking to him whatsoever. Uh, I knew that my child was safe at that time. Um, he wasn't at home. Um, he was actually being um, treated in a, a youth facility. Um, not for, not, in a, not a bad way, in a good way. Um, and I refused to answer the door. And he just kept battering and battering and battering the door. So I phoned the police and I said, he's uh, causing a breach, breach of the peace. Um, he won't leave. He's been told to leave. He won't leave. Um, and it's disturbing everybody. So they, I said, there is history. He has a criminal record for um, assault and assault, domestic battery and affray. Um, from when he took our son hostage. But that's a whole other story. Um, and uh, I said that, you know, you need to, to obviously handle with care, shall we say. Uh, so they sent one female officer around. And as soon as she got out of the car to talk to him, he turned around and said, you're going to need more backup, love. And that was his attitude was, There's gonna, I'm not going to get taken in by one woman. So there ended up being three police officers. The, the second and the third police officers came in a separate car 
one it was her first day and the second one was um what's the second one yeah she was an experienced officer but she was mentoring this this other police officer where it's new to the job and um they basically after lots and lots of negotiation he went away however um i applied for um a restraining order yeah. and i i basically i report because i'd reported it to the police the police then um sent round uh, somebody from the special unit that deals with domestic abuse and and can we just say that's so important to call because they might not do anything the first time so yeah. any problem you know call the police fe fear time. of being murdered aside um or having your child stolen you if you can call the police and just get it off and say to me, just get it on record just yeah. have it down there so with get the number because when you call back again they'll go oh this has happened before whereas if it mm -hmm. hasn't they may not be so keen to intervene absolutely and they they actually have now a special domestic abuse sort of service if you like um and the idva which is the i can't remember what they're they're there for they're they're basically a liaison that liaises between the police and the lawyers and the courts and and everything else they're there to make sure that you get all of the support that you need she referred me to Yellow Door. She referred me to the Freedom Program. Um, she helped me to get an injunction so that uh, a non molestation order so that he couldn't come to the house anymore. Um, and if he did, he would be arrested. And uh, she was absolutely furious that they hadn't arrested him and taken him away. She was absolutely <laughs> furious. And is that because of, and you have to tell us uh, about, about the kidnapping elements. It's, 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 it's what seems incredible. They could be this half and then the non-molestation was already in place. Is it because um, at that time you hadn't tapped into the support that's there? And mm. just, you know, how do you know? And nobody's kind of knocking on the door saying, oh, by the way, this is what you can do. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that the support was there. Um, I didn't know. I, I, when he had assaulted me, when he took, the child hostage in the back garden that obviously went to court and it went to court and i you know he was um given a suspended sentence and uh everything else and he was continuously pressurizing me to rev to remove my statement i had to you know sort of take my statement away cancel it you know dec decline it um and I tried because I was still at that time trying to just keep the peace, just keep the peace, whatever it takes. Um, I tried to, to remove it and they actually said, no, it's not your choice. You don't get, we're not, mm. you're not prosecuting him, we are. Um, so you can't retract your statement. Sorry, that's in. So that that all kind of happened, but there was no follow up. There was no, you know, extra person come around to see me or make contact afterwards or nothing. It was, that was it. it was like walk out of court all done but it was um, a boundary put in place and as you say you know luckily the system itself if they see they need to prosecute they they you know even if you can be bullied into retracting there mm -hmm. it's not your decision anymore which is a good yeah. thing um my, my question actually is around because i think it's a very confusing area so if another mm -hmm. parent says well i'm not kidnapping i'm just spending time with my child how yeah. how do you yeah, or I'm I'm just keeping them a bit longer than we agreed in our co-parenting plan. I think I'll bring them mm. back tomorrow. That kind mm. of thing. What power do you have? I mean, unless they're like drunk or on some form of of medication that's making yeah. them behave in a dangerous manner, are you pretty much powerless or or not? Uh, it depends. Yeah, uh, it depends on the type of custody arrangement that you have. If it's court ordered, then they're breaching a court order, therefore you can inform the police and the police will enforce that order and return the child to you. Um, if, however, it's a, a a mediated just agreement between the two of you, it's not that simple. Um, they have just as much right to be with the child as you do. And it's kind of, it's almost like possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, and it's a bit of a free-for-all. So in that kind of situation, you have to go to court and apply for an emergency custody order. And you have to 
um, follow the legal steps required to get to recover your child, basically. Um, and at that point, they become a, um, a flight risk and you can ask for supervised visitation, for example. Um, you can reduce visitation if that's what's required to, to nothing, depending on the severity of the situation. Um, but uh, it's a very fine balancing act. And again, the legal perspective just says 50-50. You know, that's, that's the other parent. They're entitled to spend time with them. Um, which isn't very helpful. <laughs> Would you say, because I, I mean, I'm be, be honest with me here, maybe this is an extreme view for someone who's no. done a TEDx on peaceful ways to deal with these things. <laughs> but um, where I am at the moment um, in, in my view on this is that you are really, as you know, big on create a proper co-parenting plan. Don't just have yeah. a shared diary, have a plan, get those boundaries, agree that as much as you can through mediation, um, and and even if that's not legally binding have that clearly in place now if one parent decides to to be blunt take the piss and just Mm -hmm. throw it out the window and do what they want or use it as a form to wind you up or take control obviously you try to say let's go back to mediation (laughs) but if they're just not going to do that then am i right in thinking that your next step is basically a defined contact order basically get a court um, I would always encourage the, the person to encourage their uh, unreasonable ex to use a um, an arbitrator, private judge, because it'd be mm-hmm. a lot quicker and a lot cheaper in the in the long run. So even if they are unreasonable, it's still a, it's still a somebody making decision for you. But to yeah. it, however you do it, that you kind of need to have that in stone, legalized completely, absolutely nailed down, um, because. When you have somebody that has no regard for the rules, um, then the only way is to is to have everything absolutely nailed down, so that no matter what, you are secure in in that child resides with you. They're only meant to be with the other parent. Of this state, this state, this state. You've got, you know, you've got it that it's absolutely set in stone, so that you can send the police in and say, "I need my child back." You know, they've kept them over and above the agreed um, parenting order, and I want my child back because they shouldn't be there. And would you um, would you agree that the, this is not an excuse for anyone who's listening to go? Oh, I won't. They, they, mediation won't work. We should just go straight for the court order because that yeah. attempt, even if you've just attempted to to do mediation and they've messed around, or maybe they've agreed on a couple of things. Um, you can show the court that you have been incredibly reasonable and actually yes. put together a plan. And the fact that the other person hasn't bothered to go in and read it or mm-hmm. or they've agreed to bits of it and not other bits and then completely ignored it, that's really important information for a judge because otherwise they don't really know who's messing about because your ex might be a very good liar. Yes, and I think evidence is key. So every time the, that boundary is crossed, you document it. Every time they're two hours late back, you document it. Every time they don't do what they say they're going to do, you document it because you don't want to stand in front of a judge and kind of go completely blank and go, yeah, but they're just not a good dad or they're not a good mum. That's that's not good enough. You know, you need to have the evidence. So the legal world relies on evidence, hard and fast evidence, before they can make any judgment. And they can't just take somebody's word for it. Um, you know, I think my child should be with me because it's my child. That's not good enough, you know. <laughs> so and, it has and, to be mm. evidence every time. And f- f- I'd also like to talk, I'd like to talk to you about um, a couple of things. One is the the fact that once you've been through all of this and hopefully put in some boundaries and things are better, that there's more to it, isn't there? You've basically got often post-traumatic stress disorder from yeah. uh, from that kind of experience and often so to the to the children so um and we're not i'm not just talking about getting a no disrespect for counseling but you know just getting some counseling may not be quite enough because there's a real impact on you and you as a parent and future relationships you have if you just go well i've done that now i can push it over into the corner it's not quite as easy as that is it it's not because you have so many hang-ups because you've almost been trained to be um, 
I don't know, uh, subservient, I suppose, is, is the word. You've been trained by your ex to behave in certain ways. And then you get into a new relationship. And certainly one of the things that I found was I got into a new relationship a few years after we we'd uh, sort of ended things with the marriage. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go out with my friend. And he was like, oh, OK, have a lovely time. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Have a lovely time. I'm kind of waiting for the, the questioning of who's going to be there, where are you going to go, blah, 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 what time does it finish, what time does it start, and the full questionnaire, and I'm like, does he not love me enough to care, wow, you know? Yes. <laughs> and that was my kind of warped mm. thinking of thinking that the kind of relationship that I had was normal, and it wasn't. And I had to to fumble around in the dark, trying to figure out what a normal relationship looked like, because I didn't know. I didn't know, um, because I, you know, I don't blame my parents at all, but, you know, but we had a household of, it, there was no arguing in our household. It was kind of like digital, that's it. You didn't fight and argue. And so I had no way of figuring out how to deal with conflict so I just kind of, you know, buckled under conflict. But I also had no idea of, of how to have a, a good, loving, caring relationship. And I had to, to learn all of that again. And I had to learn what abuse was. I had to learn what were the behaviors that were abusive so that I never tolerated them again. I had to learn... Um, how to manage and regulate my emotions because so many things triggered a, an emotional response in me that it was crazy and um, I remember my partner was we had the kids he had two kids I had one and they're all playing together and my son had apparently done something to his daughter like I don't know flicked something at her and it hit her in the eye or something so it was something minor you know kids being kids and he yelled at me we were outside and he absolutely yelled at me sort your son out and I'd never seen him behave like that and it was because he was being protective over his daughter and I, mm. I can see that now I couldn't speak to him for three weeks three weeks I couldn't speak to him because that moment threw me back and I didn't know how to handle it and my response was to to basically shrink inside myself and not communicate whatsoever so you have these triggers, you have these things that you don't even know are there. And that was years after I'd, mm. after I'd separated from my ex. That was absolute years. And it just took one, one thing to throw me back, thinking, oh, my God, what have I done? I've entered into another relationship, and this is now going to go that same way. And luckily, we managed to, to work through it and and sort it out and we're still together now but it was really really hard and I've had to you know I've had to learn new ways of communicating like you know he'd say things in a meant in a joking way and I would take everything literally and seriously and I had to learn not to do that because 99% of the time he was winding me up but I didn't know that so I always erred on the default of thinking that what he said was true. So, you know, so do, nobody so is, and is And is that what led you... I mean, that's the kind of thing you help people deal with now? Because I think that's a really good example. You're triggered. Not only can you attract in similar relationships, but even when you've got someone who is actually not like that, you can misinterpret their behaviour to be like that yeah. and, and blow it, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can completely um, confuse yourself and them and it would be the downfall of the relationship because how, how much do you expect them to take? It's not their burden to carry and they're not responsible for our happiness. We are. Um, and we have to fix ourselves and, and be able to, to find that happiness and joy within ourselves before we can share it with somebody else. Because, as I said, we, we are not responsible for anybody else's happiness and nobody else is responsible for ours. And I was trying to talk with my son about it um, on a car journey earlier in the week. And 
it was quite interesting because he said, so it's like we are two jigsaw puzzles. So I'm one jigsaw puzzle and the, my partner is the other jigsaw puzzle. So I have this hole in me that I want to make me happy. So I take a piece from their jigsaw puzzle and put it in mine. It might fit the hole, but it's the wrong pattern. And I've created a hole in their jigsaw. So they're no longer full. That's a fantastic analogy. Which I thought was a brilliant <laughs> analogy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to teach him. I'm trying to teach him mm. before he gets into those situations that it's not his job to make everybody else happy. And it's and it's very key what you just said because if you it's not just that you need to work on yourself to deal with this this trauma that you've been through and to make sure that you're never in that situation again and 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 get and sort of just t- change the legacy for that to so mm. be something that you can find joy and happiness um your children need to be or child or children also they watch you and they're learning from that so if you don't make that journey not only are you going to be vulnerable for the rest of your life but your children are much more likely to go into these dysfunctional relationships. So on Absolutely. that note of, of finding um, cure, but the healing uh, that, mm. that's needed, uh, traditionally people just think, oh, I'll go and do a f- 20 years of counselling. Um, I mean, again, no disrespect for counselling. I think it can be very yeah. valuable. But but coaching has is a particular way of dealing with things. Um which often it's, it's uh, if you could t- say a little bit around about that so people can understand the the difference and how the two maybe can complement or or be different yeah. from each other. Sure, because counselling and therapy are very much focused on what happened, what went wrong, and um, how do we analyse this. So it's all very much about looking backwards, and coaching is very much about looking forwards. So I have you know there there are people that I work with that that are seeing therapists and see them on a regular basis because they're dealing with those things that came up about their past. But what I'm working with them on is how do you navigate the future? Know what you know. What kind of future do you want? What do you want that to look like? Okay, so how are you going to create that? So what are the steps that you need to take to get you from where you are right now to where you want to be? So I'm focused very much on moving forward rather than looking back. And but with the, the looking idea... back still needs to happen. Yes. It still needs to be dealt with. And uh, no, agree, agreed. And but often I've, I've I asked uh, uh, one a lovely th- therapist once here, when's the best time to have psychotherapy? And she said, uh, when everything feels safe and you're feeling control of things, and then you can do that deeper work. But whereas the coaching uh, is often when you're in the, even when you're in the middle of the situation. It can help you focus and move forwards. Um, Absolutely. What what I wanted to ask also about the the um, the, the coaching side of things is, um, yeah, what when yeah when what point do you think that someone should come and get help if they're in a situation? And oh, actually, yes, also you because you're not just moving yourself forwards. You've got this added complication, which is where you come in, particularly with the co-parenting conflict. Mm-hmm is if you don't have to see that person again, it's a lot easier to work out how to move <laughs> forward. But you still got to do these children exchanges. you still got to negotiate with them. you still got to keep the boundaries in place. Okay. So it's a very complex, challenging situation, especially when there's been abuse and, and, um, and coercive yeah. control. So perhaps to talk a little bit about uh, what's anyone who's resonating with this conversation, what's your advice to them? I think for, for me... Um, my priority is to help that person become strong, to help that person develop develop the strength and the courage that they need to be able to take those steps forward. No matter how small the steps, no matter how big the journey, it doesn't matter whether it's a big journey, a little journey, baby steps, big steps, doesn't matter. It's about moving from where you are towards where you want to be. And sometimes that can take you years to get to where you want to be, and you just need a jump start. And that's what the coaching does for you, is it gives you the tools and it gives you the, the support that you need to, to get that momentum building. And that can be applied at any stage. It, you know, that there's no good or bad stage. There's no right or wrong stage. It's just when you're ready to move forward, but you don't know how, um, when you want to, to make your life different, but you don't know how, when when you just feel like you're stuck and you don't know how to escape the stuckness, 
then that's that's where I can can start helping you because I can help you get unstuck. I can help you move forward. I can help you to to basically take the steps that you need and even figure out what you want life to be like. Because quite often you're so traumatized by what you've been through or you're so emotionally invested in everything that you've just lost or had and you now haven't got. It's really, really hard at that point to think, what do I want? And it's about getting that person strong, strong in body, strong in mind. I'm no, I'm no kind of physical fitness kind of enthusiast, as you can probably guess. But that's <laughs> I'm not a gym bunny. But uh, you know, it's whatever they need to get emotionally and um, just get into that strength that is there. It's just been buried, and it's about finding it again because everybody has exactly what they need to be able to move forward. They just don't realize it. They just can't find it. And that's what I do is help them find that strength to, to do I, whatever it is they need to do. And I would encourage anyone, particularly when they're thinking, you know, ready, which is right at the beginning, I would say to create a co-parenting plan. Um, they need to come at that from that place of clarity of what they want to create, not a, oh because i talked to so many people it's like oh he or she won't agree with that and they're trying to mm. curtail it and they haven't even put down i'd go but what do you want <laughs> so they need to be you know they need to be working with you as part of that process of creating yeah. that plan that's, that's what i believe because you need to be able to look into the future you need to look at practically as well because is um and i think this is where it's so valuable to have as part of the best way to divorce team and, and the amicable divorce network as well is that you are able to understand the how com complex it is when you've mm -hmm. got a, a, dis you know, a dysfunctional um, ex and and children involved. It's not. Yeah. Uh, it's much. It's a whole other layer of complexity, and and that needs to be uh, t dealt with with someone who understands what that is. Yeah, absolutely. And and just you know, just going to a lawyer is is not is not the solution. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, "Oh, getting divorced, go to a lawyer." Oh, I used this split. They were really good. And and that's not the solution because you have invested so much time and energy into this relationship, this marriage, these children, everything. What you need to do is you need to build your team. Just as you would as if you were going into surgery, you would have a team of people supporting you and helping you. That's exactly what you need when you're when you're going through separation and divorce is a team of people that can tick all the boxes that you need ticked. Everybody's team is different, you know? The right people for the right job. Um, but it's important that we stop thinking, just go to a solicitor, go to a lawyer, that's it. I did that. And I honestly, looking back, I feel that that was the worst decision that I could have ever made because I lost so much financially um, that I didn't really need to lose. And if I'd had the right kind of support and advice, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have lost it. Been a very Whereas decision. now... Whereas now you know that if you do need a lawyer, this is what you're asking them to do, to find contacts yes. or whatever it is. It's very specific and it yeah. doesn't have to cost you ridiculous amounts of money because you're they're not managing the whole, they're just doing the job that they're actually trained to do. Yeah. But you're in charge and making yeah. the decision of what needs to be done. Um, because like you say, you've got that team around you to, to support mm. you. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. And I uh, look forward to our next interview. Yes, lovely. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Susie. It's been Anytime. a pleasure.